everybody. How are you doing? Hello. I've been boring them with stupid stuff while we were <laughs> waiting for you. But I thought I will try to look over, around, and through you that we might talk a little bit about a few of the places that we have to look at. So, Miles, if we can go back to the museum. Okay. All right. Have you actually been to Narvik, Norway? To Narvik? Uh huh. No. Okay. Nar does well, actually, want that's not true, but I, I'll tell you when I was there. I was there in 1975. 1975. I went all the way to Hammerfest, so yes, but not on not on the trip to research this book. But. Okay. Does anyone here besides me and Andrew know why Narvik, Norway is an interesting place to start? No. Okay. Andrew can tell you. Well, it was the first, uh, I assume, the first battle in World War II where the uh, British tried to hold the harbor and the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Nazis invaded there. Actually, it's the highest up, the farthest north that the Nazis got. They drew the line at Narvik, which is a warm water port. Um, and you get to it, we got to it, by trekking a train from Lapland, Sweden, across. There's a wonderful little train that stops in Narvik. And that museum there, are, why are the pictures still moving? <laughs> <laughs> it would be better if they don't move for the moment. Um, they have a wonderful museum there in which they explain to you. There's a one. There's a war museum on Oslo. Did you go to see the one in the Air House Fortress? Have you been there? No. There's a resistance museum in Norway in Oslo, which is really fabulous and makes you realize that we don't know as much about the the Norway theater as we know about other theaters. That the Nazis were in many ways at their absolute worst in Norway. They had a, whatever you want to call him, Uber guy that was particularly cruel. The Norwegians knew how to resist. And they were fitter, perhaps, and more used to rugged conditions than a lot of the people in Europe. Yeah, that, and no, they put up a, a solid fight, but they were not only outnumbered, outmanned, but they were fighting on completely opposite completely obsolete weaponry, but they, they defended for a while, and uh, um, but ultimately they, you know, they were overrun, and, and I guess that's where my book begins at that point, where there were soldiers, but they have no regiment to fight with anymore. Right. They also had internally a guy named Kuzlin, who yeah. some of you may know it's become a, but he was a Norwegian who sided with the Nazis and actually um, was an important figure. They killed him at the end of the war. Um, but so the Norwegians were sabotaged within as well as without. There's also, because of the geography, there was something called the Shetland Bus, which used to run from the Shetland Islands over to Norway and back and move people that were either escaping from Europe or moving agents who were going to go into Norway and help the resistance. Um, so Norway was actually very important. The king of Norway and his court eventually made it to London and if any of you have read James Benn and his wonderful Billy Boyle series, the very first one takes place um, in London and is about the Norwegian court and whatever they were doing in London. So I think one of the most interesting things about the war, Andrew, is that there's, in 10 years, you know, it, it, it did an enormous amount of damage, but there are so many stories you can't really keep up with them. This is your second one. Uh, my second World War II, right. yeah. and actually I came upon this, the, the basis of this book while I was researching The One Man, and yeah. I just um, read about um, this raid on um, the um, heavy water facility. Some of you may be familiar with it, heavy water being um, a compound that was uh, that the that the Nazis used the Amer the, the Allies didn't in their efforts in the bomb. Um, that was part of uh, isotope separation that was vital to creating an atomic bomb. And they took over a plant in this remote section of uh, I guess you'd call it central Norway um, that was producing ammonia for fertilizer. But because they had enormous sources of power from streams and lakes and rivers. Um, it was perfect to synthesize this heavy water where you can get like one drop for every, I think it's 75 drops you know, of, of, of 
measurements of water, you can get one tiny drop of it. Um, and um, when, the, when, the, when the Brits discovered that the Nazis were engaged in this kind of research, they, they, they or more than research, that they were actually upping the quantities they were making, they became convinced that this was because they were on the road to getting an atomic bomb before the Allies were. And they organized a couple of efforts to try to neutralize this factory that was perched in uh, this remote town um, on a uh, shelf of rock that was 600 feet above this unscalable gorge. And ultimately, um, when the Brits failed to do it themselves, it fell on this group of Norwegians who volunteered. Um, and basically, it was 10 men to save the world because uh, they were convinced that, that if the Nazis were able to continue this, um, that they would end up with a decisive weapon of the war. So I read about this raid that was um, such a, you know, of such valor and heroism and ultimately consequence that it was so compelling to me. Uh, ultimately, it fell on one individual to stand in the way of the heavy water shipments getting back to Germany. And speaking of one person who's at the crossroads of history and made a difference, and it's this character that I'm writing about, uh, Kurt Nordstrom, who is based off of a real figure, um, not named Nordstrom, named Hakulid, who um, basically has to choose between his heart and, and uh, his duty um, when it falls on him to single-handedly uh, prevent the Nazis from getting the decisive weapon. So anyway, it was just when, when I was working on the other book, I read about this and said, I, I, gotta, I gotta write this next. It's a tremendous story and really enormously suspenseful. Miles, can you just kind of let them go forward a little bit just so we could look a little bit at some of the landscape of Norway, which makes it clearer? Now, now, of course, when I wanted to move it, <laughs> there we go. Yeah, well, All right, that These looks are, like that looks a little like uh, it does, my right? Book. Yeah. And you can see that Norway has an extremely rugged landscape. Um, this was in June when we took these photos, by the way. So you can imagine um, there are valleys like that where you know there's. I don't think we care about the black and white ones. We can sort of skip through those. Is that Bergen? No, mm -hmm. no, it's not. Um, I think it's actually Trondheim, if I'm not no, mistaken. I was there too. Right. I was in Trondheim when Richard Nixon uh, resigned. Uh -huh. I watched it on the television about this bit. Right. Trondheim is um, an old capital. There's a beautiful old cathedral there, and it's still where the Norwegian kings are crowned. Um, and as you come down the coast, if you're, if most people sail around Norway, some of you may have been on a cruise that goes very popular. Um, you can go over the top um, of Norway, and actually, I've been all the way to Murmansk, which I don't recommend to anybody, um, even now. But that's how um, Trondheim looks, and strangely enough, it is one of the shopping meccas of the world. I'm actually wearing my Italian clothes that I bought in Trondheim. Um, and while we were there, they had a university graduation, and it was wonderful because this is an old bridge over the river. Um, all of the young women were wearing their Norwegian national costumes, so we were walking through the town, and they were walking towards us. And unfortunately, we don't have any pictures of it, but it was really um, exciting to see it. Um, I think the cathedral will show up in a minute. I can't remember. Are there any scenes in Trondheim in the book? There's no scenes, but um, just a couple of the there well, is. a couple of the characters are up there, and actually one of them, um, Nordstrom's sister, is married a university professor in Trondheim. Oh, so okay. while there's no scene, there's a reference to the university. Some of you may have read the British author Robert Bernard. Does that ring a bell with some of you? He actually taught not in Trondheim but in Trumso, which is a little bit further north. Um, but it's a, it's a magnificent cathedral. Norway is one of the most beautiful countries that we have ever toured. Um, and you can see there's a, a whole sort of Gothic front there. Anyway, this is their, their version of the Stone of Scone and the whole coronation thing happens um, in Trondheim. I thought there might be more pictures of the landscape, but there we go. Anyway, 
Um, why don't you just let them play? Because that's more or less what we had to say. Um, what else can we talk about? Did she decide that it would be more interesting to um, take this real guy and turn him into the fictional character? Well, as a novelist, I wanted to add stuff to the story. I, I mean, right. otherwise, anybody could find out what happens in a variety of places, but even Wikipedia. So, I mean, I, 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 there, there are ways that I wanted to take the story, and some of it was uh, to create um, a moral choice that this guy has to make um, in this exigent situation. I mean, uh, as someone who writes these historical novels now, that's really what I'm looking to do. It's not just tell the story of whatever took place in terms of actual fact, but to put people um, in these uh, um, you know, exigent situations and have them have to make a choice to act one way or another, and with the, the known outcome of these historical events, Ending on whichever way they go. So, you know, this guy Kurt Nordstrom, an engineer by trade, is a courageous uh, resistance fighter who um, has lost everything in the war. His, his fiance has been killed, his regiment has been decimated, his country has been overrun. Um, and, um, you know, he, you know, basically he um, is, is a soldier. <coughs> without an outfit at this point. Um, and a friend of his brings him back to the village in which he was raised, uh, where this factory is, and they uh, and smuggles to him this um, microfilm in a toothpaste container that shows how the Nazis are building up this reserve of heavy water, which only means one thing. So what they have to do is get this to England, to the right people who, who are in England. And, you know, at some point, people might have fled to England. Maybe they went over the border into Sweden and then went down to Stockholm. Sweden was neutral, and they could hop a, fer uh, hop a freighter or something like that. But that really wasn't, uh, even at this point of the war, 1943, wasn't available. So what does Kurt do? He and, uh, he and his crony, Jens, um, hijack a coastal steamer. You might have been on one of those steamers. You said you were on a cruise. I was on one of those steamers that went all the way from, I forget where I boarded it, I think it was in Bergen, and I went all the way up past uh, uh, Hammerfest to Kirkenes, which was on the Russian, on the Russian border. Um, and he just hijacks this, this steamer and makes a beeline across the North Sea for Scotland. And of course the Nazis don't want to let him do that. They see this, this ship is spotted uh, uh, from the air. Um, so it really begins with this mad dash to England, and uh, once there, um, he uh, ends up joining an outfit of free Norwegian fighters with the hope of coming back. And ultimately, he does come back as part of this mission, but um, without giving too much away of the history, because it still is a thriller, and it still sort of hopefully has a mystery as to what happens, uh, eventually Kurt remains behind. Um, after the first part of his mission to neutralize this factory is completed, and uh, he begins to form a connection with, uh, with a woman who he begins to think after the war that he could have a life with. And then, you know, the moral choice that I spoke of is that ultimately um, it falls on him that when, in order to complete this mission um, and prevent this heavy water shipment from reaching Germany, he um, has to put her life in mortal danger, so it's his choice. It's kind of almost a Sophie's choice as to how he handles it. Wow. That's not me, by the way. That's an innocent passenger on the ship. I hope we're coming to a photo that will give you an idea of just how tough it is to drive or even navigate. It's easier to go around Norway by that. water. This is Geranger, Geranger Fjord. Um, and there um, is my husband's very first car, reincarnated. Um, but I saved a couple of pictures in here of cars that would have been... They have a great museum there. Oh, there I am in my Annapolis hat. Um, that there. There's a, in the hotel there, they had a bunch of cars. And Andrew, these were cars, I think, basically from the same era that you're writing about. Uh, why they are preserved in this particular area, I don't know. Well, there are new cars in Norway. 
<laughs> okay, but you know, you think about, you can imagine the SS guys, right? They're on running boards and, you know, what that? I mean, it's just a classic. Well, speaking of SS guys on running boards, um, obviously every hero needs a villain in a thriller. Um, now, the Nazis make perfect villains, I suppose. I did that predictably, I guess, in The One Man. Um, but the real villain, and, well, there's two villains in this book, and one of them, the human villain, um, is a member of the Quisling NS police force. And um, it's someone named Dieter Lund who grew up with Nordstrom. They were all sitting in the back of the same, in, in, in the same classroom. Lund in the back, Nordstrom maybe towards the front. He was a person that might have been the last person picked in the soccer matches. He was a person that didn't get the, the girls. He was a person that was not, you know, thought of as the top of his class. And he just spent his early life brooding and resenting the people who were successful. And of course, this is just the type of person that found ways in the, in, in the Gestapo or places like that to, to um, um, form a career. And he's now the head of the military head the police head of the region, and he begins to have a strong sense that his old nemesis Nordstrom has come back to Norway, um, clearly on on this mission, and so he really acts as kind of a Inspector Jovert, um, trying to sniff Nordstrom out um, and behaving about as ruthlessly as the Gestapo did, did in the countries that they occupied. Um, but there's another good slide, there's another um, enemy in this book, and that is the Norwegian weather. Uh, much of this book takes place in the winter. Look at that, excuse me, and I just interrupt you there, I mean, imagine, you have to drive over that, but, you know, imagine these guys trying to make, look at the roads. Yeah, that is uh, quintessential That's at the fjord. top of, yeah, at the yeah. top of um, Garanger, but in or, it's even terrifying to do it on a, on a bus today, or in a car today. Um, That's really pretty. It is. It's a beautiful state now, church, right? That's yeah. an old, an old church sort of in there. But I think um, that the weather is actually just as difficult to navigate and possibly even well, more treacherous. A lot of this book takes place in the winter. Right. The reason why these commandos could only be parachuted in in the winter is they needed darkness. The planes, the Halifaxes that would bring them in, were slow enough that they'd be shot out of the sky if it was during the 24-hour periods of light. So they had to wait for the winter, but with the winter comes the storms. And this group of commandos who were called hillmen, meaning that they grew up in the mountains, that they were completely capable and self-reliant. They could, they could light fires, they could hunt their own food, they could, you know, know how to burn uh, uh, water from, you know, from ice. And, um, but once they landed, um, once they were parachuted onto uh, the plateau, um, they faced the most ferocious storm that any of them had ever lived through. And there's actually a great two pages to read in here. I've been, a couple of other events, I've been reading them because it just shows how vicious this storm was and how these people literally were, were, were plotting one step at a time with 70 pounds of explosives and, and food on their backs. And literally it took three hours trudging into the gales, uh, the howling gales, just to go, you know, yards. Um, and were not for this fortuitous hut that came out of nowhere, literally, um, these people would have perished on the first night that they were back in Norway. Actually, I could say, although I don't think I have a photo of them, that there are huts dotted about up in the mountains and so forth, and they are there. You, you might think at first they're like shepherd's huts or something, but they're actually just survival huts um, for people. There's a yep. lot of cross-country skiers, or regular skiers and so forth. And they're communal. People yep. own the huts, but it's perfectly acceptable for travelers to stop, spend the night, um, and in this case, um, they weren't so concerned about being polite because it saved their, saved their life, obviously. But then it turns out that they're 20 miles from where they're supposed to be, and 20 miles trudging in this kind of snow, um, skiing actually, but in this sort of snow with these type of gales, um, was you know three days of punishment. So. That's Bergen, by the way. Yeah, that's. This is the Bergen fish market. My husband, the photographer, is always on food, as you probably have worked out by now. But 
Uh, would you like to read that? I mean, I don't see any reason why it would be great. You know, it's uh, people haven't seemed to mind it. So let me, uh, if you, we if someone a copy gives me a book, book and okay. uh, right. Does anybody have? Well, I'll just go get one. Oh, you're willing to spare one? Thank you. There you go. You can give her a fresh one if you. It's only two pages, but it's uh, it just sort of sets the tone for how this book reads. Um, two things worth mentioning. Um, one, this is when this group has now been dropped on this plateau back in Norway in the middle of the night. Um, it takes hours for them to get the 12, to find the 12 or 13 uh, crates of supplies, supplies also including their explosives, their ammunition, their guns, their food, uh, clothing, etc. Uh, and they finally get it and then they have to set off to find four people who were the advance party that were already there. And the other thing worth mentioning is that um, catering to the American audience, I put an American in this group of ten, um, and his name is Gutterson, and he was a member of the 10th Mountain Division, um, and I just sort of did this a little bit as pandering to an American audience, but he turns out to be a great character, and of course he thinks that the, uh, uh, and I think it comes across a little in here, he thinks the Colorado uh, uh, winters are really severe, and so he's sort of mocking, not having been in a Norwegian winter, he's mocking it a little bit. So I think that's where we are here. Um, so Ronenberg, who's the leader of this group, says, if we're not in Bjornsford, then where are we? He asked. Striken? Striken? Let's hope not. That's almost 30 kilometers off, Nordstrom said with dejection. And look, he pointed east. The mountains that were in sunlight only a moment ago were suddenly covered in clouds. With the swiftness of a squall at sea rising up out of nowhere, the skies darkened and the winds kicked up. Well, it seems you're about to get your wish, Yank, Ronenberg muttered. Button up. The wind seemed to sweep in the clouds, sweep in the clouds, and in an instant they could feel the temperature plunge. There was no doubt a storm was coming in. They were miles from any shelter they knew of. These could last an hour or a couple of days, you never knew how long or how strong it would be. Which way, Ronenberg deferred to Nordstrom. One thing they all knew, they couldn't remain there. There they'd be at the mercy of nature. He checked the winds. Your guess is as good as mine. I say continue east. Into the teeth of it? Ulf Peterson questioned. The winds had now started to howl, even knocking Gutterson's hood off, and snow was starting to swirl. We'll never outrun it, Nordstrom said tightening the toggles on his hood. Button up, Yank, he turned to Gutterson. We're about to see firsthand if you were born to be a hillman. Within minutes, whatever hope they had that this was just a passing squall was dashed. The wind sharpened into icy gales, howling like sirens. Frozen snow hurled around like sand in the desert, bit at their eyes. Large drifts piled up around their skis, making every step a task the weight of the packs on their backs bringing them to a virtual halt. Visibility became zero. Pull up your mask, Nordstrom yelled to Gutterson above the howl of the wind. Inside their hoods they had only the narrowest exposed slit for sight, but they could see only an endless sea of white anyway. As the temperature dropped, the wind drove arrows of frozen snow into their eyes, clamping them shut, virtually blinding them. The only benefit of such a storm, though a small one, was that the blanket of blown snow would cover their tracks and eliminate any trace of them if the wrong people happened to pick up their presence. They leaned into it, pushing against the gales, one step at a time. In minutes, each became covered in white. An hour of slow going passed. Nothing familiar appeared. Then two hours. They were only able to go about a kilometer. It was becoming nearly impossible to carry on, and Nordstrom knew they were now completely lost. Worse, without shelter, he knew they'd have to dig in somewhere on the side of a slope with nature's fury raging all around. This was a bad one, it was becoming clear, and in this kind of storm, even the most experienced of men could only hold out so long. But just finding such a sheltered spot was next to impossible, with the snow-swept gales battering them and the snow so thick you could barely see your hand in front of your face. Come on, all of you, we have to go on, Ronenberg pushed them on. But his eyes connected with Nordstrom's and betrayed an expression of concern which Nordstrom rightly read as, we're in for a tough fight here. 
They trudged about another kilometer, almost to the point of giving up, when suddenly Peterson, who had assumed the lead at that stage, pointed ahead with joy. Look! You could barely hear his shout above the shrieking gales. It was a hut, a hunting cabin, almost entirely encased in a blanket of fresh snow. The wind blew so fiercely and visibility was so limited, they didn't come on it as much as bump directly into it. Thank the trolls, Jen thrust his poles in the air triumphantly. Fuck the trolls. Thank whatever beautiful son of a bitch who owns this place, Hans Storhog said. He loosened the icy door frame with an axe, pushed it open with his shoulder, and the seven of them tumbled inside. So that's sort of how life uh, goes on for our commandos. That's how it starts, and it, it actually gets a little airier after that. You can see from the landscape, we have some acquaintance here, you know, with how the weather can swirl like at the airport, and, you know, take, so you can imagine with all those mountains, valleys, fjords, and whatever, that in the winds, that it's totally unpredictable. Well, three years ago, I was here in a, in a dust storm, oh, in a... In a, in a haboob. In a, in a Let's haboob. get it right, yeah. right. Yeah. And I forget when it was, but it was counter-seasonal to these haboobs. You know, I forget which book it was and when it was published, but I remember, um, right. you know, and, and, and the size of the audience corresponded to the fact that there was a... <laughs> You can be in Metro Phoenix, though, and the weather can be completely different. My mother used to live, when she was alive, about five miles from us, and it could be raining in Paradise Valley and completely dry where we were, or however. Um, in Norway, it's really kind of an extreme example of that. So I'm sure a lot of you guys remember novels and movies like The Guns of Navarone or Where Eagles Dare. And yeah. I think this is very much a book in that spirit, just a big sprawling action adventure um, novel with a bit of romance to it as well and just enough, um, I guess I keep using the word moral choice to, to um, you know, make it something that will be a meaningful book. Wow, Alistair MacLean. I didn't really make that analogy, but you're right. I, it, how many of you have read Alistair MacLean? I've read everything he ever wrote. Yeah, right. It is. It is very much in that. Um, in that. Do you remember the one where they're going across Greenland and the guy has diabetes and he's sinking into a diabetic coma and they're not sure if they're going to make it across in time? I feel like I saw the movie. I don't think I read. I don't know. What was that called? Uh, I can't remember. Was it Ice Station Zebra? Ice Station Zebra. I think it was Ice Station yeah. Zebra. I love books like yeah. that. I think, you know, there were there were a lot of books written closer to the war um, that had that, you know, tremendous height. Guns of Navarone was in the Mediterranean, wasn't yeah, it? it was wasn't it some Greece, island near yeah, Greek? Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and as I say, most of us know a lot more about Central Europe or, you know, the French invasion and all than we know about these peripheral well, areas. That's sort of what's interesting as well about the book, is that it, 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 it really gives, enlivens a theater of the war that very few people sort of knew about. And um, I, I, uh, I was telling, I guess, Paul inside there that um, the book before this, um, I spent, from the point of view of family and, and, and culture and tradition, um, I guess making an Eastern European Jewish culture hopefully real to, to people. Um, I can do that kind of in my sleep because I come out of that. You know, the humor is real to me, the, sense of the, the stories, the, the ethics, but this was a completely different thing for me and this was a real literary challenge as far as I'm concerned, but I'm pretty confident that those who read it will almost feel like um, honorary Norwegians at the end of this. You know, I think it comes off okay. You know, Norway is in an interesting position because they had the North Sea on one side and then easy access to England and Scotland, which were allied. But on the other side is Sweden. Um, and Sweden claimed to be neutral, but in point of fact, there were some pretty serious fascists in Sweden and still are. Um, that was part of what Steve Larson wrote about, right? And some other people. So Norway was in an awkward, um, in awkward geographical as well well, as the other thing political is the, situation. The Germans, Hitler to some degree can was... You, excuse me, can you stop that there for a minute? No, 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 just the, the photo. Can you go back? Hitler was convinced because of the jagged, endless jagged coastline that this was the perfect spot for the Allies to invade, not necessarily Normandy. So there were right. 300,000 troops, German troops in Norway, mm -hmm. um, which probably troops that 
could have been used elsewhere. I wanted to go back to that picture because there's sort of a modern echo, the one just before it, Miles. Those mountains behind you, there's a, there's a train, a really interesting train, and it goes by what are called the trolls. And that picture at the bottom that looks so peaceful, this is a place, as you can plainly see, is incredibly rugged. And so it's become a, um, not bungee jumping, but you know, a people. Base jumping. Hang gliding. Hang gliding. Yeah, hang gliding, gliding, gliding and base gliding. jumping. Well, anyway, so many people used the trolls to do that and kill themselves that Norway had to put a ban on doing that. So that little peaceful valley that had the rolled up hay thing and all like that was actually at various points splattered with people who thought they could in fact leap off the trolls and part of the problem was the air currents were so are so severe there that you know even if you thought you knew what you were doing as if you came from Colorado or something um, it just didn't didn't work that well yeah um, and it, it'll be interesting to see you know depending on your age, how much of it you get to see, what global warming, what the effect will have. Because if you go to Scandinavia, it becomes totally clear to you that, in fact, it's melting. And even, Andrew, I don't know if you have been to Holland recently, but Rob and I went there last spring, and we were taken to visit. Holland has created this terrific barrier um, against the North Sea outside of Rotterdam. And what we learned from that is, is the Scandinavian ice fields and glaciers are melting. Scandinavia is rising, and Holland, which is at the bottom of the North Sea, is sinking. They already had trouble, yeah. but now it's getting worse. So, you know, it's, I mean, I, I found that fascinating. It didn't even occur to me that as all of these ice fields up north are melting, you know, that it will depress some areas. So Holland's in a race with Miami Beach to see which yeah. one is going to be cool. But I think they're probably taking better defense in Holland than in Miami. Well, the Dutch have figured out that bringing the water in is a better deal than yeah. keeping the water out. So they've, they've come up with a whole lot of, of different things. But I can imagine that this landscape, you know, was really fascinating for you to explore because it would be different. Well, and culture and people, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, not just the physical plant or the or, or terrain, but the uh, the whole Norwegian culture, which, um, um, like I said, it was it's 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 sort of a foreign one, the Scandinavian right. one to me. So um, it's it's, it's easy, always easy to write about what you know and what you've grown up with, um, but when you have to take something that's completely different and make it seem intimate to the readers, it's. It's it's a, a little bit of a, of a, I, I guess uh, not only a challenge but you can take some pride uh, in your job for for doing it. So. Why did why did the Nazis charge up to Norway so fast and so early? Um, warm water points for Swedish iron ore, basically. It's what they wanted up in Norway, as you say. Right. Um, but um, but the other thing was. Um, they convinced that you know if there was ever an invasion, it was going to come from the north. So you know, to to the degree that I, I'm not, I don't know. That well, there were three possible sites. One of them was for North Africa to go up through southern Europe. The other, another was was Normandy, which is what actually happened. And then a third one was Norway. So there was a huge effort at disinformation to keep the Nazis from ever locating which one was going to be the actual um remember the whole famous thing about the body that you know the guy that died and I'm trying to remember how it all went they gave him false papers and all sorts of things and shoved the corpse out so the nazis would find him and his whatever he had with him i think revealed that it would be north africa would be the there's a whole story about oh, it. Oh, I mean, that was the like British intelligence. Yeah, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, um, so you know, I don't remember there was as much disinformation about Norway no, I don't as think the there potential was. I, I don't, you know, place. Yeah. But they went there so early, you know, and I, I wondered also if they had any kind of long distance thought about maybe helping contain Russia by, you know. Um, if the Russians it's, decided yeah. to fight, I can't speak. I mean, I can't speak. Well, no, I know. I didn't know if strategy. you'd run if you'd run into any information while you were researching it. 
No, no, that, no. Not particular thing. So have you decided that you're um, going to go on writing? I mean, you did one man, and I thought it was a personal story, and then you ran, which it was, right? Mm -hmm. And now you got interested in this one. Do you see yourself going well, on? Well, um, as always happens when you come out promoting a book, I'm more than halfway through the next one. Um, it's, it's another one that's historically set, but it's, um, it's set in New York City uh, between uh, 1905 and 1935, and it's the it it really traces the formation of the women's clothing of the women's garment business um, in conflict um, with the unions that were taken over by Murder Incorporated at that point by the Jewish mafia, and the Jewish mafia was the Jews then were even more ruthless than the Italians. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Italians at that stage were farming out their their hits to the Jews. And you know names. You know there are there are tons of you know famous Jewish mobsters. Whether it's Louis Lepke or Meyer Lansky or Dutch Schultz or um, um, the, the famous guy that uh, in the desert. I'm just blanking. Um, Joe Bonanno. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. The, Joe Bonanno doesn't have much Jewish blood in him. <laughs> um, um, who's the guy? That, I'm just having a senior moment. Who who created Las Vegas? Bugsy, Bugsy oh, Siegel. Oh, yeah. oh, um, but but in any case, so it really is the story of an of an apparel, a young garment entrepreneur who comes head to head um, against uh, vendettas of the Jewish mob. Um, so um, and, and it's also built on some family stories. So um, I'm doing that next, and then uh, I just came back from four weeks in Southeast Asia um, this past week, and. Um, Everybody was asking, um, uh, you know, are you, are, are you, did you do any research there? And I said, well, as far as the IRS is concerned, yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I did sort of come up with a story um, based in Singapore um, that would be another World War II story. And I ran it by my publisher just in three or four sentences because I, I don't have it thought out yet. But I, it's the kind of thing that I'm sort of warming up to and think it might be interesting. Um, I don't know if anyone could guess which country had the highest casualties in World War II. Anybody want to, I mean, it's, who said that? China. China. Yeah. Not many the whole people would say it. The whole tragedy of Nanking. Yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, if you extend World War II back to where the Japanese invaded it, back to 1931. Um, but in Singapore, Singapore was about half Chinese, and when the Japanese invaded it, and, and, and uh, the British surrendered it, um, what they did to the Chinese there was not dissimilar to what the Nazis did to the Jews in Europe. And so I sort of was thinking that I could have an interesting story built again on a theater of the war that people really don't know a lot. Uh, I mean, I won't go into what I have in mind, but it would maybe involve an American soldier of fortune who falls in love with a Chinese woman who he's not able to get out before the Japanese um, take it over, and then she and her family undergo a lot of these harrowing experiences, and maybe he comes back and saves her. And that sort of what thing. do you know? What do you know about rubber? Because that's rubber? really a big thing. Well, in this theater. Yeah, um, you know, I'm trying to. You know, rubber actually uh, was the the um, reason why uh, the French went into Hanoi. Um, originally, <coughs> the rubber trade there. Well, I don't know how many of you know that the British, who were really good at stealing stuff, um, sent an expedition up the Amazon to Manaus in order to steal pots from the rubber trees that, at that point, only were in Brazil. And they took them back to Kew Garden and grew them, and they moved them to Malaysia and started the whole rubber plantation, rubber tree plantations in Malaysia. And it was because the Japanese captured Malaysia, Singapore, that we then got synthetic rubber. That Goodyear and those guys had to come up with a way to make rubber in order for us to go on with the war because the whole supply went down. I mean, you know, it, it really, yeah. there was more globalization than we realized. You know, it's a big topic today, but I'm telling you, in the 18th and 19th centuries, and actually, if you want to go all the way back to the Silk Road and so forth, globalization has been with us 
forever. Well, mm -hmm. globalization and colonization. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. But I think so, Singapore is fascinating. Yeah, so anyway, that, that, that's sort of uh, how I'll write my trip off. <laughs> Sounds great. Meantime, they were also next door in Burma. Yeah, you know that whole raw materials was a huge part of the war machine, wasn't it? Yeah, a, a, yeah. a need to get because Alan first has written a number of books yeah, about so, um, yeah. you know the what the Romanian oil, which the Nazis needed, and you know various other cogs in the war machine. You know, so when you were writing domestic suspense on your own, or when you were writing books with Patterson, did you? envision did, were you interested in history or was it really because of the story in one man that so moved you no i, I really wanted to write uh, books with bigger heft to be honest with you okay. and, and, and and larger themes and you know I, I i can't sort of say that the entire umbrella of crime fiction is narrow but a lot of it was narrow to me you know i have to be honest because so much of it was about the mystery of solving murders or solving a crime and and generally it always seemed that so much and I tried to fight this as best I could so much of the crimes were about human passion or 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 jealousy or sex or you know god forbid not insanity that's no motive but you know since you mentioned Patterson how many you know you know to me it's never been a motive for a good murder for a good mystery or thriller but in his case, it's been there. It, he's done all right with it, I guess. Well, I was yeah. asking you in part because so, the style that pervades in Patterson novels is not really the style that necessarily works well in, in historicals. Well, I, not ne I never, I mean, I didn't choose to get involved with James Patterson. It just was, it was, uh, it, it found me. Yeah. And, and, and my first six published books were with Jim. So, I know. So, uh, I mean, that, the only reason I was working with him is that it was a lucrative thing, and you know, um, it wasn't the kind of books I really wanted to write or the style I wanted to write in. I think, interestingly, it took me a long time to unwind what I learned, not only what I learned to do with Jim, but when I went out on my own, I was paid to write Patterson-esque plot-centric right. stories. No, I remember your books for Harper Collins were like that. And they were yeah. sort of suburban yeah, suspense. Well, they, they there was one that started on a train, if I remember. Right, right. right a train that, that uh, where, there, where there's an explosion. Right. Kind of a 9-11 episode. Uh, um, but but it, it's taken me a long time to even find my own style. I, I mean, I, I think uh, two or three books ago, um, I, I wrote a book, uh, Everything to Lose, where um, um, whoever it is that reads my stuff, uh, where someone, uh, a character named Hillary, finds this cache of money on, on a back road in Greenwich, Connecticut, and, and um, ends up taking it. And of course, you know, things happen in her life uh, correspondingly. It was sort of the first book where I actually thought I wrote it in the, in the style that I really wanted to write, as opposed to the style that my publishers were expecting from me, or paying me for, or, you know, and and so gradually, it's you know even you know 15 books into my own career, I'm just sort of coming in touch with who I am, you know, and and the kind of stories I want to tell, which I think are the kinds of stories I, are, that take place over time, and not just you know over over days or months, but in certain cases over years, and that involve you know bigger themes and 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 family and 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 uh, I don't know, you know. Um, how 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 these things interact with history? So I, I like it. I like where I am. You know? I think you. Well, I, I really was fascinated. But how many of you have read One Man? And if you haven't, I recommend it's that good. you do. Um, I was really fascinated when I read it. I got a long and moving letter from your publicist and so forth about you know this yeah. was something really different um, and. Um, you know, it was clear to me that you had found a different, a different yeah. voice and style of you know. I mean, you know, it's hard to have a real ticking clock. You know, you don't really want to have short chapters and you know immediate payoffs and so forth when you're looking well, at the story whole like that. thing. I, I, I was telling someone today uh, in, in your back room that this book has gotten really rock solid reviews, even more than the One Man, which I, I, I couldn't have been happier with the One Man. And I'm a person who's never been used to getting good reviews. You know, I don't even know what to do with them. You know, because <laughs> it's not that I didn't write decent books. It's just simply that that I think when you 
I, I firmly believe that when you come out of the Patterson, you know, when that's in your tail, everyone assumes that you're writing just sort of page turning airport novels, you know, that, that, uh, that don't have much substance to them. And it's, it's, they're sort of, yeah, but books. Yeah, there was a lot going on in this book, but, you know, it still has sort of a, a Patterson origin. So it's taken me a lot of my career to, to um, you know, put that aside. Well, this, this is actually a really slam-bang story and incredibly important because if, in fact, this raid had not worked, and the, the heavy water, water <laughs> the war would have been very different because, in fact, the Nazis might have been able to get to nuclear power, um, and there we would have been, or at least done serious damage, you know, to London. They never really had a big enough payload with the V2s to wipe out right. London. Right, but you know what's so interesting about World War II? There's, there's, I don't even know that I know all of them, but there's like four or five different things that if that didn't happen, we, you know, the Allies would have lost the war. So you know, it's you mentioned the V two and V. If they right. didn't, if they didn't, if the RAF didn't eliminate that, then there's the the British spy network that uh, um, that that undercovered all the German spies. That if if there's you the know, Enigma, th then right. there's the Enigma, which right, right, the machine. You know, um, I mean, there's uh, you know all, and then then there's this one, and so there's all these different things that the war could have turned, um, and it's not just one event; it's several events that you know you don't know where we'd be at this point. So it seems to be something one can endlessly explore. I also think there's so much interest in it at the moment. I said this before, in our own time when we have no idea what's actually happening, it's interesting to read or comforting to read about a drama when we know how it played out. You know, and as Ken Follett once said to me at a convention in New York, he said it's the only war that he knows of and the reason people write about it because it was so clear who was the bad guy and who was the good guy. You know, it was a really black and white right. one. You can't say that about the First World War, which was all grays and a series of disasters. You no, know? that was a confusing war. No one even knows why that war started, you know. I mean, you know, you know, you know the event that started it, but the why it was all this domino effect of all these treaties and plunged it. I, I actually, we were in Vietnam last week in Cambodia, and it was very emotional for me because I am um, old enough to be a, not a draft dodger, but I guess someone who was the recipient of a favorable number, you know, to avoid the draft. Um, and, and um, you know, everything I sort of felt I knew about the Vietnamese people that, that were sort of bludgeoned into you by the Nixonian government war machine here, um, and then I remember people like Jane Fonda would go there, you know, and, and, and Joan Baez, and, and, and there was still a part of me that would say, you know, God, they're giving aid to the enemy, that sort of thing. Well, I, uh, we've never met people that were as genuine, as gentle, as, as, as caring, as giving, and as forgiving of Americans as, uh, uh, as, you know, in terms of not knowing the right and wrong of that war, you know, and in Cambodia which was a war, of course, that we didn't even acknowledge was taking place, we still killed 750,000. We bombed, they lost 750,000 lives in that war. And they, 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 I mean, they're so gentle and so loving. And, and uh, it really just, you know, I guess my thinking is, one, how we ever went to war against these people, I have no idea. And two, how they beat us, I have no idea, <laughs> because they're just such gentle people. Um, but anyway, you know, that was just sort of an aside. That <laughs> if you go there, they call it the American War. And actually, yeah. fascinatingly for them, it was just a blip. In right, the, real... the War of American Aggression. But now they're changing it back because relations are so good between the two countries That's that they're true. willing to call it the Vietnam but War. Not to insult the Americans any more than, if you know, they're arguing... The Chinese are expanding into the South China but Sea. That's their tradition. So now they don't enemy. want to call it the China Sea anymore, you know, right. because they think that China. The reason the Chinese are grabbing it is because it's called the China Sea, so they want to call it the Vietnam Sea. But they've always looked north. I mean, for them, the war has always been with China, and we were just a small chapter <laughs> that they easily blew by. You know what? I think that we should. Um, you're, are you live streaming or Facebooking this or both? 
why don't we say goodbye to our Facebook audience because we've been on for quite a while. Thank I you didn't very know much it. Goodbye, for Facebook. doing that. We appreciate your viewing and I don't, you could turn off the live stream if you want to and then why don't we ask questions. I always think questions are better when nobody's being filmed. Yeah. <laughs> Let me, uh, she had a hand so Andy, um, do you think you're going to 